Humanity wasn't prepared the day the first wave struck. Neither the second. I can't see that. What the? Day after day, the relentless asteroids hit, laying waste to the planet we once called home. Millions dead, the remainder surviving by whatever means. The last hope of humanity was to reach for the stars, to discover new worlds, new possibilities, and hopefully, one day, rebuild the humanity we lost. These are the voyages of a starship wombat, their crew, and Captain James L. Connor. Actually, mate, that's Jimmy. Jimmy L. Connor. Hey, engine room. Yeah, mate, what's up? Can you uh, get us out of here, mate? Come on, chop, chop. Nah, sorry, mate. Not happening. You really buggered it last time. Hi, this is part two of the roundup of new macro products. The first video has all the crowdfunding stuff. This one has pretty much everything else. And if you didn't hide your wallet, as I suggested in the first video, I'd really do it for this one. JLC PCB are the guys who provide all my PCBs and is a major sponsor of my videos. They can produce one to six layer boards with 0.4 to two millimeters thickness, track widths down to 3.5 mil and support BGAs, cutouts, fingers and even impedance matched PCBs. And they can do all this within 24 hours. They are currently offering 10 PCBs for only two bucks and if you are a first time customer, you'll get $20 off shipping off your first order. Click on the link in the description below to check them out. After seemingly pulling out of the maker scene entirely, Intel are actually back with their T265 RealSense tracking camera. This new camera has some pretty decent specs. The unit has a USB 3.1 port for interfacing, two 170 degree field of view cameras, six DOF IMU, is powered from an Intel Mavidius Mirrored 2 VPU and only consumes 1.5 watts at full throttle. Intel also claims that it provides 6 milliseconds latency between movement and reflection, so it's fast enough for augmented reality applications. This is a tiny unit and at 199 US dollars a pop is pretty tempting. Over at ST Micro they are wedging their foot in the Linux store a little more with the release of the STM32MP1 SOC. This is a chip that contains an ARM Cortex-M4 real-time processor running at 209 MHz and either a single or dual ARM Cortex-A7 running at 650 MHz. It supports DDR3 RAM running at 533 MHz and Quad SPI, NAND and STMMC flash memory interfaces. There's also the usual plethora of interfaces such as Gigabit Ethernet, HDMI driven from a 3D GPU, CAN, USB, MIPI CSI and DSI, USB as well as some decent security supporting encryption and secure boot. Along with the release of this SOC, they have also released two evaluation boards. There's the more expensive board that breaks out pretty much every feature of the SOC with 1 gig DDR3 RAM, USB Type-C, an onboard ST-Link programmer and a whole bunch of other stuff I'm really not going to mention. Really, there's everything there. Or for $300 US less, you can pick up this evaluation board which removes a lot of the more expensive items and has only 512 megabyte RAM, but it's still quite usable. While we're on the topic of the new STMicro SOC, over at Contron they casually mentioned an upcoming tiny module based on the STM32MP157. The 25.4mm square PCB has 512MB RAM, 2MB NOR flash, 512MB NAND flash and castellated edge connectors breaking out 200 megabit Ethernet ports, 2 USB 2.0 ports, 8 UARTs, 2 CAN, SDIO, parallel RGB and DSI display outputs as well as a bunch of GPIOs. Pretty impressive little board that was being shown at Embedded World this year. Shame I'm still getting a 404 error and there's been no update since. And not to be outdone by Contron, over at Arrow they have the Avenger 96. This isn't anything to do with Marvel, rather a 96 boards compliant SBC. It has 1 gig RAM, 8 gig EMMC, SD slot, HDMI out, gigabit Ethernet, USB ports and the typical low and high speed 96 boards headers. But looking at the underside of the board, this seems to be just a baseboard for a module 
which is being produced by a company called DH Electronics. It has a very similar lineup to the Contron module and about the same size, but instead of castellated edge connectors, it has a 271 pin LGA underneath. So hand soldering is really out of the question here. On the other side of the fence, there's a bunch of new SBCs being released based on NXP's IMX 8M mini sock, which has a quad core Cortex A53 running at two gigahertz, real time Cortex M4F and 2D and 3D GPUs. It's based on a new 14 nanometer silicon process that reduces thermal and power issues when running at a faster clock rate. The Cortex M4F can wake up the Cortex A53, so this sock has some decent low power capabilities. Boundary devices have released the Nitrogen ATM Mini that has 2 or 4 gig DDR4 RAM, 8 or 128 gig eMMC, SD slot, PCIe, gigabit Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, audio in, out, RTC, the usual lineup of GPIOs, MIPI, CSI and DSI, but sadly no HDMI, LVDS or LCD RGB. They also have a SOM that has pretty much the same lineup as the full SBC, but with 2 gig RAM and 8 gig eMMC flash, and of course a lower price. Back in the Arrow Camp, they have two new SBCs. The AIML not only has the IMX SOC, but 2 gig RAM, SD slot, HDMI, and MIPI out, gigabit Ethernet, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, SIM slot. USB 3.0, mini PCIe, and the usual low and high speed 96 board compliant headers. Then there's the Thor 96. Okay, is there some sort of Marvel theme going on here? This mighty board has 2 gig RAM, SD slot, oh, blah blah blah. It has the same specs as the AI ML, but has an additional Zigbee module. There's no idea on pricing on either of these yet. Not to be outdone by tiny things, CompuLab have released a 38 by 28 millimeter module based on the IMX 8M Mini. This module has up to 4 gig DDR4 RAM, up to 64 gig eMMC flash, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and pushes out gigabit Ethernet, PCIe, MIPI, DSI, and CSI, SDIO, I2S, UART, and a whole bunch of GPIOs onto 200 pin headers which they don't have a picture of, but it's there as you can chuck this module onto their baseboard, which breaks out everything onto physical connectors. Oh, and a proper USB 3.0 port and DC jack. Nice. Over at Tex Nexion, they decided to one-up everyone else by releasing a bunch of new products based on the IMX 8M. There's the Axion Pi, which has a very familiar footprint, but breaks out gigabit Ethernet, MIPI CSI, HDMI, USB, and seems to be powered from USB Type-C. It also has one gig DDR4 RAM, eight gig eMMC flash, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and an imx 8 m based SOM. This SOM has everything I mentioned before contained on it. So the Axion Pi essentially just breaks out connectors and provides proper power management. It's slightly bigger than the previous IMX 8M modules, coming in at 37 by 40 millimeters. Then there's this module that's very similar to the previous in terms of specs, but with a dim style edge connector. Jumping over to Germany, they've come out with a similar 200 pin sodium style module called the Caro, or Caru, I think, which has nothing to do with our mode of transport down under. This board runs with 1 gig RAM, 4 gig eMMC flash, and breaks out all the important stuff like MIPI DSI and CSI, 100 megabit Ethernet, USB, PCIe, and a swag of UARTs. Nice. And to show that they mean business, Google have come out with their very first SBC called the Coral. This has an Edge TPU module running an NXP IMX 8M SOC. Google Edge ML Accelerator for TensorFlow, 1 gig DDR4 RAM, 8 gig eMMC, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and pushes out almost everything else onto a 300 pin connector. The baseboard then breaks out SD slot, USB everything with USB Type-C for power, gigabit Ethernet, HDMI, MIPI, CSI, DSI, audio, and a Raspberry Pi header. And I bet it really is fully Pi compatible, but won't really know until I have one in my hot little hands. But wait, that's not all. Google have also released the Coral USB Accelerator, which has an Edge ML Accelerator. It also has an ARM Cortex M0 to control things a bit, and of course, USB 3.0, designed to enable drop-in access to Google's TensorFlow. If you're in the US, you can currently pick these boards up from Mouser. 
the USB accelerator for 75 US dollars and their coral for 150 US dollars. Bear in mind that these products are restricted and you can only buy them from within the US. While we're on the NXP socks, they have also just released the IMX8M Nano. This sock lowers the clock rate of the Cortex A53 cores to 1.5 GHz, but uses a faster Cortex M7 core running at 600 MHz. It doesn't have any hardware video codecs, so it was designed for low power applications. Apart from that, everything else is the same. It's been a while since we've heard from the BeagleBone guys. Well, they've just released a new SBC called the BeagleBone AI. This is based on Texas Instruments AM5729 SOC, which is a competitor to Google's AI and deep learning technology, and runs a dual-core Cortex A15, dual-core C66X DSP, and quad-core embedded vision engine. The SBC also has 1 gig RAM, 16 gig EMMC flash, gigabit ethernet, USB type C for data and power, thankfully, and the all familiar beagle bone headers. Nice. Back in the rock chip camp, we have a couple of new SBCs from Geniatech. First up, there's the DB3399 Pro. This, of course, runs the RK3399 Pro hexacore SOC with either three or six gig DDR3 RAM, eight, 16 or 32 gig EMMC flash, gigabit ethernet with PoE support, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, six USB 2.0, one USB 3.0 and USB Type-C ports. Mini PCIe, HDMI out, and yet another board with HDMI in. It also has DisplayPort, EDP, and GPIO header. This is the second board we've seen with HDMI in capability, but I can't really see how it's providing it. Once I have some more details, I'll publish it on my website. This board complements the lineup of other Rockchip based SBCs, such as the developer board 3399, running the RK3399 with 2 gig RAM, 8, 16 or 32 gig EMMC flash, dual HDMI, DP, EDP, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, really pretty much the same lineup as the DB3399 Pro in terms of IO options, but with a full sized SD slot, strange. Then there's the developer board 9, which is a smaller footprint version of the previous board and only supporting 8 gig EMMC flash, with a footprint of 155 by 105 millimeters. Then there's the developer board RK3288, which of course runs the RK3288 SOC with 2 gig RAM, 8, 16 or 32 gig EMMC flash and pushes out dual HDMI out, also has HDMI in, MIPI DSi, EDP, DP and unusually CVBS, which is a composite video out. There's also this connector, which I haven't been able to find out any info on. If you find out, let me know in the comments below or the Micmac forums. Then there's the developer board 5, which is more of the same, but cutting back to one HDMI out, two USB ports and audio interfaces. But look at that, it does have a funky old style toggle switch for power. The Pi64 guys are back with another SBC in a now classic Raspberry Pi form factor. This one sports the all-winner H6 quad-core Cortex-A53 running at 1.8 GHz with 2 or 3 GB DDR3 RAM, 16 MB SPI flash, EMMC socket, SD slot, USB 3.0 and USB 2.0 ports, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Gigabit Ethernet and of course HDMI out. Power is via DC jack, nice, and there's no PCIe which is a good thing really. I don't know of anyone getting PCIe going on the all-winner H6. Oh, there's also a maybe compatible GPIO header. Who knows? Another Taiwanese company is dipping its toes in the SBC market with the Mapleboard MP130. This runs the all-winner H3 SOC with 1 gig DDR3 RAM, 8 gig EMMC flash, SD slot, USB 2.0, HDMI, 100 megabit Ethernet, audio in and out, and the low and high speed 96 boards compliant headers although it seems you can also purchase a cheaper version without these headers. Power is via DC jack and also has soft power and reset buttons. Heading over to the friendly guys, they have the Nano Pi R1. This is a small SBC running the all winner H3 with 512 meg or one gig RAM, optional eight gig EMMC flash, SD slot, two USB ports, Wi-Fi with SMA connector, Bluetooth, gigabit ethernet, and also 100 megabit ethernet ports. There's also headers for UART and RTC battery. 
It comes in a snazzy enclosure providing access to Ethernet, USB power and external Wi-Fi antenna. As you probably have guessed by now, it's aimed to be used as a gateway router. So Friendly Arm have provided images for OpenWRT. You can pick up the eMMC version for 39 US dollars and the non-eMMC version for 29 US dollars. So bang for your buck is pretty good. As mentioned in my Nano Pi M4 review video, we were waiting for Friendly Arm to release a SATA hat for the M4. Well, they've done just that, and this board breaks out four 6 gigabit per second SATA ports. They've produced some benchmarks using IOZone against various storage technologies, and there's no disappointment there. Of course, you're not going to see the speeds of NVMe, but hey, for that price, I'm not complaining. When bolted on top of the M4, it looks like a pretty compact and neat unit. Back in weekly roundup number 56, we saw the Banana Pi 2.0. It was supposed to be a direct competitor to the Raspberry Pi Zero, but was still a little bit pricey. Well, the Banana guys have released another version called the Banana Pi 2 Maker, which is identical to the Zero, except it drops the eMMC flash. It still supports PoE modules, and you can still replace the dodgy micro USB power connector with a DC jack. Apart from that, it's identical and also cheaper. They're also thinking about releasing a new SBC called the Banana Pi M4. Not to be confused with the Nano Pi M4, this board actually runs the Realtek RTD1395 SOC, which is a quad-core Cortex-A53. It comes with either 1 or 3 gig RAM, 8, 16, 32 or 64 gig eMMC flash, SD slot, a nice M2 key E slot, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 100 megabit Ethernet that supports any standard Pi PoE hat, USB Type-C, nice, and all the usual GPIO mod cons. It's a promising board and it will be interesting to see how they handle the logic level conversion of the RTD1395 SOC and how it stands up under my testing once I get my hands on one. If you're looking for a bit of stereoscopic video grunt, then there's the Inforce 6560 SBC. This runs the Qualcomm Snapdragon's SDA660, which is a SOC with 8-core Cairo CPUs running at 2.2 GHz, an Adreno 512 GPU, Hexagon 680 DSP for computer vision processing and a Spectra 160 dual camera image signal processor supporting a single 24 megapixel or dual 16 megapixel camera. There's also 3 gig DDR4 RAM, 32 gig eMMC flash, SD slot, USB 3.1, gigabit Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, HDMI as well as 4K out on a USB Type-C. It also has GPS, 9DOF IMU and GPO expansion header. Coming in at $220 US, that's also pretty decent bang for your buck. The hard kernel guys have now announced details of the Odroid N2. This runs the AM Logic 5922X SOC, built on 12 nanometer silicon technology. It has a quad core Cortex A73 and dual core Cortex A53 processors. The A73 cores run at 1.8 GHz, which hard kernel claim they see no thermal throttling using a stock fanless heatsink. They also claim 20% faster overall CPU performance, 35% faster RAM speeds when stepping up to the DDR4 RAM. So a bit of a step up and it will be really interesting to see this perform under real world tests. Apart from that we see the usual lineup of everything else. 2 or 4 gig RAM, 8 megabyte SPI flash, eMMC flash socket, SD slot, 4 USB 3.0 ports, HDMI out as well as composite out, RTC header, PWM fan control if you want it, and the usual 40 pin Pi header thingy. Power is via DC jack, thank goodness, and this little baby draws only 1.8 watts when idle and 5.3 watts under full CPU load. Nice. Over at CNX Software, Jean-Luc let us know about the new Orange Pi OS image releases. There's an Android 9 release for the Orange Pi 1 Plus, which supports Linux kernel 4.9.118, this is a welcome relief for anyone using that SBC as support for it was fairly poor. There's also an update for the Orange Pi RK3399 with kernel 4.4 and an update for the Orange Pi 4G IoT. This is all pretty important stuff as the Linux kernel 4.x series is starting to look a little old. Speaking of the Linux kernel, last month we saw Linux 5.0 being released. This is one really nice update for anyone playing around with SBCs. 
This merges into mainline official support for a couple of new architectures and file systems. Sox running the big little architecture, which is almost all Sox these days, now has an energy aware scheduling option, which allows tasks to wake up on the more energy efficient CPUs first. There's also massive changes across all Sox. All winner Qualcomm, MediaTek, AMLogic, Samsung and Rockchip. This last one will be interesting as one of my subs mentioned I should retry my tests on the Orange Pi RK3399 using kernel 5.0. There's also new architecture support from NXP, Marvel, Renesis, and CSky. So some really big changes for the ARM world, nice. If you're into robotics, then Qualcomm have released a robotics RB3 platform. This is a 449 US dollar kit, which sounds a little pricey, but for that, you get a new 96 boards compliant Dragon Board 845C SBC, running an octa-core Snapdragon 845, of course, at 2.8 gigahertz, four gig DDR4 RAM, 64 gig UFS storage, SD slot, USB 3.0, gigabit ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, HDMI, MIPI DSi, and a bunch of GPIO options pushed out onto two high-speed and two low-speed 96 boards compliant headers. As part of the kit, you also get a Qualcomm Spectra 280 camera with dual ISP connectors back to the mainboard. So once again, bang for your buck is pretty good. Free RTOS now supports RISC-V. Oh, I should have really expanded that bit out. Free RTOS now supports RISC-V, which is a good thing. No, really it is. It's something that has been lacking for a long time and will pave the way for an even faster adoption of the RISC-V architecture. Not being satisfied enough with the launch of the STM32MP1 SOC, ST Micro has also released a Bluetooth IC. The STM32WB runs a Cortex M4 running at 64 MHz, and also a Cortex M0 Plus running at 32 MHz. Applications written for this IC will run on the Cortex M4, with the Cortex M0 Plus handling all the comm side. You also get 256 kilobyte RAM, one megabyte flash, but also a quad SPI interface for more storage. There's also a bucket load of onboard encryption support, and you also get 72 GPIOs ranging from USARTs, USB, ADC, SPI, ITC, and others, with almost all of their GPIOs being five volt tolerant. That's a big bonus for people wanting to use this in a mixed logic level environment. Power is from 1.7 to 3.6 volts, and has various sleep modes, getting this IC down to 13 nanoamps in shutdown mode, 600 nanoamps in standby mode, running the RTC, and 2.1 microamps in halt mode and RTC. That's some pretty serious low power options. If you're into LoRa or want to look into setting up your own LoRaWAN gateway, then this next one might interest you. PyCom will soon come out with the PyGate, which is a low cost eight channel gateway that can connect to a LoRaWAN or PyCom's PyMesh network. It runs two SX1257 transceivers, along with a Semtech SX1308 baseband processor and supports LiPo battery charging via USB or PoE based ethernet. You also get ultra low power standby modes. Access is via a USB to serial bridge and pricing is around 50 euros, which is pretty good for what you're getting. Another one for robotic fans, the Onion Omega guys have come out with an uber cheap full 360 degree LiDAR kit. For the almost 200 US dollar price tag, you get an Onion Omega 2 Plus board, Power Dock 2, and Delta 2B LiDAR, which can scan at 5,000 samples per second with a range of 200 millimeters to 8 meters, scan rate at 600 RPM, and a resolution of 0.25 millimeters. Now that's a pretty decent bang for your buck as well. Over at IT, they have the new Sonoff RGB LED light strips. Like all the Sonoff devices, you can connect it to Google Home or Alexa, or control using the EWI Link smartphone app, and control any of the LEDs along the two or five meter IP65 rated waterproof lengths. Pretty cool. The IMX RT is another semi from NXP, which is a hybrid MCU and SOC. It runs a 600 megahertz ARM Cortex M7 processor, providing real-time capabilities that you see in MCUs, but also runs a Linux kernel. So you get the best of both worlds. Seed Studio has the Arch Mix, which not only runs an IMX RT1052 SOC with 32 megabyte RAM, but also has 64 megabyte flash, eight megabyte SPI flash, SD slot, 
two USB ports, a parallel RGB888 LCD interface similar to that present on the BeagleBone and Raspberry Pi, RTC battery header and 44 pins of GPIO goodness. If you want to play around with these socks, it's a cheap way to do it. Back in weekly roundup number 58, we saw the Lychee Nano, which is a tiny SBC based on the all-winner F1C100. This board has very similar specs to the Arch Mix with a real-time capable sock, but you can pick it up from Seed Studio for only $8 US. Nice. Back in the same weekly roundup, we also saw this FPGA board, which is another low-cost entry point into the world of FPGAs. Running the not so popular AN Logic Technologies EG4520 FPGA, it's capable of 20K LUTs with 130 kilobyte static RAM, 64 megabit dynamic RAM, 8 megabit flash, and a castellated PCB pushing out 40 GPIOs. There's also an FPC interface for connecting displays and cameras. Back in weekly roundup number 61, we saw the Sipid Max running the 800 MHz Kendrite K210 SOC. It's an interesting IC with a dual-core RISC-V processor, field programmable I.O. array, neural network, and audio processor supporting 8 mics at 192 kHz. Well, you can now pick up this HAL 9000 looking unit with onboard camera, mic array, speaker, LCD, thumbwheel, SD slot, 48 GPIOs broken out onto two headers and full LiPo battery management. And you get all this for only 41 US dollars. The SNPs AI voice platform is an AI framework for those who are more security conscious. It allows full offline voice recognition similar to that provided by Google, Amazon and Apple. Of course, it will require a little more work with voice training required, but comes with a voice training assistant to reduce the training time. You can pick up one of these kits from Seed Studio for only 115 US dollars, which includes a Raspberry Pi 3, re-speaker hat, temperature and humidity sensors, relay PCB and acrylic sheet to mount everything on. Over at Adafruit, you can pick up a GPIO expander hat based on the MCP23017, which is a 16-port GPIO expander controlled over ITC. This IC isn't capable of PWM, but any of the pins can be set as an input or output with internal weak pull-up or pull-down resistors. You can also pick up a Pi Moroni key bow, which is a Pi Zero hat providing 12 programmable membrane-style keys. Each key also has an RGB LED underneath allowing visual feedback of key presses. Over at SparkFun, they're stepping up their AI game as well with an Edge dev board. This runs the little-known Ambic Micro Apollo 13 Blue MCU that is powered by a Cortex M4F MCU running at up to 96 MHz. It also provides Bluetooth 5, has 1 MB flash and 384 KB RAM, and spits out all the usual GPIOs that you'd expect. This MCU is capable of running TensorFlow Lite, requiring only 6 microamps per megahertz, so as a very cheap entry point into voice AI. The PCB provides headers for an OV7670 based camera, JTAG and Quick, and also has a 3 DOF IMU, 2 MAMS mics, and a few LEDs. The whole thing is powered from a 1.8 to 3.6 volt DC supply, or even coin cell battery. If you want to get into heads-up displays, then you could probably do it with this. It's simply an OLED display without any backing, but according to SparkFun, is easily visible during daylight. Note that this isn't a graphic OLED, but has predefined areas that can be lit up. Access is over ITC, and there's also an Arduino IDE library. However, it will require an MCU with a fair bit of RAM, like the Atmega2560. Here's another cheap LiDAR module. It's much cheaper than a real LiDAR because it uses a time-of-flight rangefinder instead of laser. So accuracy isn't as good, detecting objects at up to 12 meters away with a 1% accuracy. But at that price, it's good enough. Access is over UART or ITC with 5 volt power and logic levels. It's all contained within an IP65 rated enclosure, which is more robust than anything you're connecting it to. However, if you want a more expensive version, then this one is capable of detecting objects up to 180 meters away. It's still based on a time of flight sensor and is powered from 5 volts with access over 3.3 volt logic level UART. As always, you can find links to everything on my website and if you want to keep up to date with the latest and greatest in the maker product scene, then hit subscribe. Oh, and also that uh, bell icon that YouTube forgot about. 
If you do actually have anything left over in your wallet, you can also support this channel further by joining the cool bunch of patrons I have helping me keeping the lights on, either on Patreon, PayPal, and a whole lot of other methods. So that's it for part two. If you want to check out part one for even more wallet draining goodies, then click up here. Thanks for watching. See you next week.